Like I couldn't resist showing this slide. It shows you how to um, target a $33 billion resource before lunchtime. Uh, you can see in the airborne gravity over here, you don't see it. You put it into a, an enhancement routine and bingo, you get a lump. This is all covered by jungle containing anticlines and things. I thought this was an anticline, but the client went out and shot this seismic line across it, showed a huge carbonate reef, which they drilled. It flowed eight, oh, it flowed eight, uh, 70,000 barrel, barrels of oil equivalent a day. It's been certified at uh, 10 trillion cubic feet of gas, and at current US well held uh, wellhead prices, it's worth $33.5 billion. Anyway, we'll go on to some, something more intellectual. What about the other red bits on that? <laughs> oh, there was, there was a half a TCF up the corner there. That was, that was a bit in the afternoon. And <laughs> okay. Um, so here we have the... Oh, gosh. Here we have the familiar... Uh, aeromagnetic map of Australia, but this one's been continued up 500 metres. And what I'm going to talk about are many of these big red blobs. Now, you can get uh, big red linear blobs from uh, fragments of island arcs, from uh, fragments of ophiolites. You can get big red blobs over the Pilbara iron deposits and, or over the middle back range iron deposits. <coughs> but I'm going to talk about a lot of these other red blobs, and <clears throat> I really, really believe that they have an uh, important significance in uh, uh, allowing regional and specific targeting of mineral deposits. Basically, I believe that well, the red blobs that I'm going to speak about, uh, I believe, come from mantle plume and rifting activity. So <clears throat> here we have uh, a well-known uh, uh, a ver version that I produced in 2000 of uh, uh, what mantle plume activity. This diagram was largely based on the work of the people at ANU, the research team there. You, the, the bubbles of hot stuff uh, allegedly rise from the core mantle boundary and you get this sort of hot stuff or magma which comes up and it, you get a big pond at the bottom of the lithosphere. Some drivels up sometimes to the bottom of the crust and you get underplating of the crust and at the surface you get um, a doming because all this goes on and you get fl flood basalt and so on. Now, <clears throat> uh, my ideas are pretty well consistent with, there's a wonderful book by uh, Franco Pirigino, I don't know how you pronounce that, but uh, he was at the Geological Survey of Western Australia. It's called Mantle Plumes and Ore Deposits. It only costs uh, $350 US for a copy. Uh, it's a steal at that price, and, and I really recommend his book. Uh, I didn't actually get a copy of it till three years after I pre prepared the diagram, but basically my idea is the same as his, but what I, I believe I'm seeing in the magnetic data are these large <coughs> uh, mid-crustal sills which act as magma chambers which uh, feed, feed this various activity up here. He's got a few of them in there, but he's, he's a bit different to me. Now, uh, the next step in, in the mantle pl plume business... It, oh, shit. The next step in the mantle plume business is after the doming, the uh, igneous rocks cool and shrink and get denser and you get substance and very often you get a, 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 an inter intracontinental uh, uh, sedimentary basin formed over it. Now, just to show you that these things probably do exist, here we have down in the south... south uh, And it's a bit small, this, for an old man. <laughs> this is in the southwestern corner of South Australia. This is a 50-kilometre wide gabbro that's been drilled, and it's surrounded by this pink stuff here. There are so, some basalts that have been uh, uh, intersected in, in the holes, and I believe, well, in, in the book, The Geology of South Australia, they identify this as a mantle plume phenomena, and I believe that this... 
uh, central gabbro is the, is the feeder business that I was showing you in my, in my ideas. And what's significant, you've got a big one there, 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 and a big one there. And they're all surrounded by these, <coughs> these um, uh, hot spots or, 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 or the, these large magnetic anomalies, which I believe to be these <coughs> mid-crustal sills. Uh, interestingly enough, the Bushveld intrusion in, in, in South Africa has a similar geometry with a, a, a central igneous body and these big lobes. So, so the idea with mantle plumes is that the bubble arises in the core mantle boundary, comes to the surface, and later on another bubble starts at the same place on the core mantle boundary, but because the lithosphere is moving, the next bubble comes up in a different place. And this is why you get chains of seamounts like the Hawaiian chain. But here I am saying this is probably one of these things which is actually on the continent. Interestingly enough, the path of these, these intrusions it sort of under, underlines sedimentary basins like the Officer Basin. So those basins may be re related to SAG, to SAG above, above the mantle plume. Now, what you actually see at the surface in, in the magnetics, you don't see all these phenomena all the time, but very often you get flood basalts. Uh, that's in pink. In orange, it's this a mid-crustal sill. Uh, you, you, commonly, you can see a central hole or a central feature, just like down here, which I believe is the, is the main stem to these things. You often get um, uh, clusters of little um, uh, igneous plugs and so forth, and also you commonly get radiating dike swarms. Here is an example from the Cooper Basin in South Australia, where there's this big one of these blobs with a hole in the middle, hole in the middle, which exactly underlies the Patchawara Trough. We've done modelling of this. It's down in the basement. It's 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 a it's a, it's a mid crustal feature. Interestingly enough, <coughs> this although this is a huge trough over here, the gravity effect of this is so strong. There's almost no gravity low over the Patchawara Trough. Uh, just fit, fitting in with the, the substance idea, you can see here that there's a sag o o over the Cooper Basin, Basin area, which um, fit, fits in with the mantle plume model. Anyway, here, here's my go at, at Olympic Dam. Everybody else has had a go. Uh, basically, the Olympic Dam area has one of these magnetic blobs. I've done a very rough model here showing that the, blo the red blob can be explained by some uh, mid-crustal igneous feature. Uh, I just wonder whether some of these mid-crustal sills can act as the magma chamber to uh, uh, source or uh, well, act, act, act as kind of an engine to, to drive the fluids to, to source things like uh, uh, the Olympic Dam area. I noticed uh, in the in the presentations on Mount Woods that they've got a similar magnetic blob underneath them in, in Mount Woods. They've even got a, a, a gabbro in, in, in the centre of their areas. Excuse me. And uh, as everybody be, has been re remarking, uh, the, there's a, a uh, an opaque zone un underneath the, uh, the Olympic Dam area, and I, 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 I'm sort of just sort of wondering if, if this is evidence of one, one of these mid-crustal sills. Various other people have alluded to this possibility, and Ken's been showing uh, uh, magne magnetotelluric evidence. But anyway, so, so so anyway, the question: uh, What are the sources of these an anomalies? I, I, I'm guessing that they're mixed. Ultramafic anorthosite complexes, maybe something like the, the Stillwater complex, the Duluth co complex, or e even um, something a little bit like the Bushveld intrusion in the Capvale um, <laughs> Craton of South Australia. Um, 
So I've had a go at uh, discovering a, a, a few, few things that could be related to these things. I, I said previously that um, maybe these are, uh, contain anorthosite complexes. Now, the, in the Grenville province in Canada, there are a lot of anorthosites, and they've got the lacteo hard rock titanium deposit there. So anyway, there's a, an anorthosite complex called the Muck, Muckanippi anorthosite complex in South Australia. So I thought, well, maybe it's got a hard rock titanium deposit. Normally, it spent $2 million <coughs> exploring for collecting gravity and magnetics for gold out there. Anyway, I got hold of their data and, and there was this huge magnetic anomaly which was also a, gravi a gravity anomaly. And I thought, well, maybe that's a, a hard rock titanium deposit. And there was a line of <coughs> rab holes going by which had high titanium values. So I took the, the idea to Eluca and they drilled a whole lot of holes and found a big hard rock titanium deposit but it only had 9% titanium and I think you need 13%. So anyway, it was a, um, it's a long-held idea that um, <coughs> kimberlites are spatially associated with um, uh, mantle plume locations and I, I identified a mantle plume location about there on the basis of this dike swarm <coughs> in the Pilbara. So uh, on the basis of my idea, the company went out there and explored for, for kimberlites. They found kimberlites with diamonds in them. And, and anyway, um, several years later, I've, I've thought about what controls the, the kimberlites. I, I've now come to the conclusion it's more likely to be sort of the dilatation of, of, of the cratons where, where the dikes are, the, they get tensile effects that it makes it easier for the, the kimberlites to come up. There's a, very analogous situation in in uh, uh, the slave craton you, you, uh, in in Canada. You've got incredible dike swarm coming coming down from the Mackenzie hotspot, and, and uh, fr from what work I've done in, in that area, it, it seems to me that the the axis of the concentration of the kimberlites is really along the gut the guts of the uh, of the dike swarm. So, on on the basis of that. I would say the best, these ideas, I'd say the best place to explore for diamonds in Australia is in the incredible dike swarm crossing the Gawler Craton, which, which actually has fragments of Archean lithosphere. So there's a freebie for you. <laughs> Here's one of my failures. <clears throat> so on the left, you see the, uh, the magnetic pattern over the Mount Weld um, rare earths deposit. Uh, on the right, there's a magnetic pattern which is vaguely similar. This particular uh, anomaly had, had a drill hole drilled into it, not, not on the basis of a carbon, carbonatite, but it, it had hit carbonated peridotite. So we figured it could be, you know, it could be a zone carbonatite, but we, we just drilled three more holes and they were all just carbo uh, carbonated peridotite. So it was a bit of, or peroxidite rather. So, anyway, just there's, there's all these exo exotic type of deposits which are arguably spatially located with, with, with uh, ancient mantle plume locations. Now, you probably need to sort of have a fair degree of erosion till you get till you get down to these type of deposits. But anyway, I, I, I hope I've just given you some some clues. How, how you can identify the, these fossil mantle plume positions. I won't read all that, but uh, it's pretty good stuff. Okay. <clears throat> so th there's a very old diagram from Burke and Jewish showing how that you get triple junctions across the dome over mantle plume locations. In, in, in my experience, you don't get a lot of triple junctions more or less, you, very often you get uh, a crack hurtling off away from the dome position and the crack is uh, generally on a line of cr crustal weakness between two, uh, two different uh, crustal blocks like an Archean craton and a Proterozoic block. But here, 
here we have the, uh, uh, some images from up in the MacArthur Basin and it arguably you've got a mid-crustal sill beneath the Mac MacArthur Basin and, and this is up in the Batten Trough uh, and that, that's, that's a, a known rift which is hurtling away from, from where, where the crest of the mantle plume would have been. These are two crustal, different crustal blocks, I can't remember their name. This is, this is another one of these classic classic uh, signatures of the, these, these blobs. Look, this, this has continued up a thousand metres. You know, this, this is not a volcanic flow or anything. That's, that's got to be a really thick magnetic mass. For those who uh, don't know, like th thin, thin surface basalt shows don't give any ma magnetic effect uh, over the top because the, the, the top and the bottom are so close together the polarity effects cancel out. And on thin magnetic flows, you only get anomalies at, at the end at the edges. Here's a, a diagram I published in 1997. I've been basically publishing the same diagram uh, since 1984. It's not much different from what you get in most, most textbooks. Um, <clears throat> but when, when rifts form, you initially get some extension, but as the extension progresses, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the you get a rift form because it, it just, just cracks. This, this is a McKenzie type model. Some people have big shears, but I, I notice this type of model applies best around the world. Now, <coughs> what is really significant, as the extension goes on, you get this intrusion or the crustal thinning, uh, and, and you get a combination of um, decompression causing intrusions along the axis of the basin. And <coughs> if the extension continues, you actually get splitting down the middle of the, of the rift and you, you get you know, in, intrusion on, on both sides. Now, what happens, the, the, the rifts actually pr progress away, uh, 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 <coughs> away from the mantle plume. You get the most extension near the mantle plume and then a, a little bit less and eventually get out here. But a, as the extension in, increases, uh, you, you, you get the, in, the intrusion up, up the, develops up the middle, and then if, if it goes on further, it, it actually splits in half. And so you get all these stages of the rifting, and they're accommodated by these transfer zones, which allow differential extension. And each of these zones has a different magnetic, sig ma magnetic signature, depending on, on the size of the extension. And typically, in, in the rift here where it hadn't split, you, you get magnetic highs and gravity highs in the middle of the rift. A lot of people think the rift would be a gravity low, but not normally they're gravity highs. Now, <clears throat> here's some uh, fantastic stuff from Ethiopia. I had the luck last year to interpret a $15 million FTG airborne gravity and uh, magnetic survey over this area, and so I, I did a bit of researching, but <clears throat> uh, here's some seismic <coughs> tomography from underneath the rift, and it's ac they're actually able to, to they're, they're imaging, they're, they're imaging these intrusions which are al along the axis of the rift. You can see this is just south of the AFAR triangle. You, this is the, the classic triple junction of Burke and Dewey. You know, it's splitting there, and, 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 and the, the, you've got wide extension there, but it's narrowing, narrowing down to, to just a rift here. And along the axis of the rift, you've got all these different in, in, intrusions, which uh, are the, and the black triangles are volcanoes. And um, here, here's a size of big tomographic image of one of these intrusions underneath the rift. Now, VHMS deposits like in the Woodlark Basin, they're, they're sort of down the axis of the rift and they seem to, seem to be associated with volcanic centres. You know, this, this is probably not uh, generating VHMS deposits because the, the, I think you need sea, sea water and all the rest for that, but this I, I, I'm, I'm putting to you, uh, is, is if you can recognise these locations, uh, you know, you're probably in VHMS territory. And uh, here 
We have, this is Joseph Bonaparte Gulf, where there's a beautiful rift which shows all these features I've been talking about. There's a, it's, it's widest out here and, and it's, it's a pointy end down here where it's really um, quite narrow. And basically, you can see here, if you, if you model the, the gravity, you can, you can model this thing coming, coming up from, from underneath. And this is probably my most important slide today. So here, this, I'm now over this, on this black line here. Down here, I'm saying it's just a classical rift, but up here, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that the rift is split. You know, instead of just getting one gravity anomaly from the central intrusion, up here the, the intrusion is split and you're getting proto-oceanic crust in here. And <coughs> uh, Geoscience Australia shot this uh, wonderful sea floor, uh, sea bottom seismic tomographic refraction survey and they've inverted, uh, they've inverted the, the seismic data. This, this is the moho or or this, this, all this stuff here is kind of igneous rock, you know, showing how this, this basin is split. This is an actual a seismic reflection uh, section, section across it. These, these things here give, give gravity highs, they give, magne they give magnetic highs. That, you know, that, you know I, I think that's fairly um, convincing evidence. I actually sort of published that section in 1988, nobody took any notice of it, but uh, yeah, so now other significant things. Down here on land, there's a, the Solby Hills lead zinc deposits which flank a, a Proterozoic quartzite uh, uh, ridge which is underlined by a magnetic anomaly and the Solby Hills lead zinc deposits are in carbonates growing, growing around that inlier. Now I rather suspect, but I can't prove that structure was, was caused by just the, the, the tip of this um, <coughs> ridge business. Now, <coughs> back, back in 1984, I published a paper saying, so, oh, <laughs> Okay, so there's this gravity anomaly down in the southwest corner of South Australia, which I said was a rift in 1984. I went back, and that's a, the modern day magnetics, and it, I, it's interpreted as a layered, uh, mafic, probably ultramafic intrusion, which I think it's, it's, I think it's the equivalent of one of these things from the floor of a rift. This, this one's been un, un, unroofed. Um, <coughs> BHP did a bit of cursory expert exploration there in the 1990s. <coughs> I took it to a company and they floated solely on this particular anomaly. Their shares went from 20 cents to 156. For, for it's, a lot, it's too complicated to explain, but um, anyway. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm just... What I'm doing here, I'm trying to give you an interpretation of the sources of many of these layered intrusions. Now, this next one, you'll laugh at. So see here, see here this intrusion has come up and look, look how there are major faults you know, being around that intrusion, right? Remember that. Because here we are at Broken Hill and at Broken Hill, there are these two big gravity anomalies, which obviously come from deep down. A lot of people have said that Broken Hill is a rift. Now, what is really striking is that the known lead, zinc and other mineralization tends to form on the edges of these big gravity anomalies. This is the line of load of the Broken Hill ore body. Now, I, I put to you, that if Broken Hill's a rift, the, the, these big gravity anomalies could be these types of intrusions that I'm showing you, and 
they develop major faults along their side and in between these intrusions which are splitting apart you would have had very, very hot, hot, hot area because the crust has been very, very thinned and that could have been the, the driving action to, to cause broken hills. So the, the moral here is to go searching for broken hill anomalies on the edges of anomalies like these. Uh, in, there's a company called Silver City Minerals that's currently exploring just up there. They, they, they've got load horizon rock, they've got good geochemical anomalies, and they've got an IP anomaly, and um, they'll, they've been drilling there, and they'll re release their, their results soon. And uh, just lastly on this, this is some GA seismic, which is approximately across here. And if you use your imagination, you can vaguely see an, in, in, an intrusion in there. And uh, here we are to finish up. So in 1993, I produced a book on how you find uh, massive sulphide, uh, uh, copper, gold, lead, uh, silver deposits. Uh, BHP bought seven copies. They only cost, first one was $1,500. Rio Tinto was really stingy. They only bought six. Anyway, so using the book, or the ideas in the book, uh, went out, uh, found this area in northern New South Wales and got a company to drill that anomaly there. There'd be no drill hole within 50, meter, 50 kilometres of it. The area had never been held under expiration licence and Pung, they, we, we found this new mineral province and uh, the very, very first hole and uh, the, 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 these other ones have got um, uh, similar type mineral, mineralisation in it. The mineralisation of the sediments are identical to, to Cobar, so it's, there are, it's arguably a, an extension of the, co the Cobar belt. So anyway, uh, so anyway, my brain's empty and <laughs> 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 that's it.